So, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Gwen McCausland. I'm the director of the South Dakota Agricultural Heritage Museum. And before I introduce our speaker, I have a bit of housekeeping to do. Uh, Meredith Redland's talk that is scheduled for tomorrow night has been postponed. So uh, please check out our social media and our website for any future dates. Um, also, I would like to acknowledge South Dakota State University acknowledges the land that it occupies across South Dakota is the ancestral and traditional and contemporary lands of the Ochete Shakoween, uh, meaning seven council fires, which is the proper name for the people referred as the Sioux. We acknowledge that before these sites were named South Dakota State University, they were called the home by the people of the Native American Indian nations of this region. I'd like to welcome Chuck Volan of this, uh, for his program, The State in Transition, South Dakota, Rural South Dakota since the 1970s as part of our Crossroads Change in Rural America exhibit and speaker series. Do you want me to go over your um, past? You have a PhD. <laughs> uh, you have a PhD from University of Nebraska and your academic interests are uh, areas of expertise are American uh, Western expansion, Native American history, social history, and prohibition history. Uh, Dr. Volan is currently an associate professor of history here at SDSU as part of the School of American and Global Studies, and he's also a um, uh, board member of the museum. So um, he's also one of our state scholars for our exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America, which is currently on display in the museum. So I definitely uh, welcome everybody after his talk to visit the exhibit before you leave. So please welcome. Chuck Bowen. Thanks, Gwen. Oh, I can get it. There it is. All right. Well, howdy, folks. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I, I, it's really always nice to have an audience. As a historian, I'd probably talk whether you were here or not, so it's just way better that you are. Uh, as a historian, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be going a bit out of my comfort zone today. Historians do not typically uh, talk much about, say, the, the previous 20 years or so. We like to let things kind of uh, settle, and we have the same passions uh, that everybody else does. And uh, so you, you try not to get too close to the present because you want to be as, as honest and accurate as you can be and as objective as you can be. Uh, but uh, I was asked to do this talk, and it's, uh, it's certainly something I think about a lot. I teach South Dakota history here. I'll be doing it next semester. And uh, one of the things that has always struck me is that uh, just as you're getting up to uh, the, the real, you know, high acceleration of change, we say, all right, see you later, have a great semester, and, uh, you know, we'll see you in another class. And so I'm going to look at some things that I don't normally go over in class. Uh, let me just ask uh, a little bit about you all. How many of you are from uh, a, a rural area? Just curious. All right, got quite a few of you. How many not? Uh, one thing I've been noticing over the years as I teach South Dakota history is that uh, I was asked that question, and in, in recent years it's been pretty normal uh, for me to not have anyone in the entire class who is uh, from an actively farming family. And my next question is always, well, did, whose grandparents farmed? And whoop, the hands go up. Yeah, it's a big difference. So let's, let's see where we can go with this. Well, I can think of no greater period of change in American history than the last 40 or 45 years, certainly in rural history, I guess I should say. Uh, we've got something of a, a unique twist, and I don't mean that as a euphemism, but uh, as the best way really to describe South Dakota. In a lot of ways, uh, South Dakota and, and rural South Dakota has become more like the rest of the nation in other ways it's moved away from the rest of the nation. Uh, and uh, let me say, uh, um, my goal is to generally look at some of the positive changes, but it, they have to be uh, addressed within uh, the context of some negative changes. Uh, rural America has been suffering from uh, real problems, not just here, but really nationally. We talk a lot about deaths from despair, as an example. And we've got folks taking meth and fentanyl, which is uh, a pretty lethal, nasty bit of mi business that people probably normally wouldn't uh, play around with. So let's think about how these things have been going. Uh, on and off reservations, South Dakotans changed the way 
that they went to school, worked, and connected with the world in recent decades. Uh, they moved, uh, sometimes out of their community, sometimes out of the state, uh, while other people and, uh, from other countries and states have moved in. And many of these changes impact the state in different ways, really depending on whether we're talking about whether it's a rural or an urban place. And let me say that the, the 20th century was uh, a real transformative century here in South Dakota. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got periods where we've got real growth and then decline. And so a lot of folks, uh, when they talk about, say, uh, depression, economic depression, they start in the 1930s. Well, the depression started here in the fall of 1920. And uh, we're gonna see a real collapse in prices. Uh, we're gonna see high interest rates, which are always a real problem for farmers. And we'll see folks like this, they're standing on this land that dropped 58% in value. And that's before the depression. And then the depression hit and it grew even worse. And a lot of these changes are gonna push people off of the farms. And when people go off the farms, uh, sometimes they move to the nearest com uh, city, but often, uh, or their town, but often they move to a another city or even out of the state. So we're gonna have actually a lot of migration uh, from farms in the 1930s. Right? Everybody thinks about uh, Okies. Well, there are actually loads of photographs of South Dakotans on their way to somewhere else. And I think this is a sort of a fascinating set of numbers. I'm gonna talk, I give you a lot of numbers today. Uh, most places we don't see declining populations. South Dakota lost population in the 30s. That's how tough it was here. Uh, South Dakota was the number one recipient of federal aid in the 1930s. And that's saying something, that's on a per capita basis. Right. The World War II era uh, also changed South Dakota considerably. Uh, we're going to see uh, a lot of smaller farmers getting out of the business. And this is in part because we've got growing mechanization. And, uh, you know, having an uh, uh, expensive piece of equipment, you've got to really justify that, you know, by production. And so we're going to have farmers, small farmers, leaving. I, mean, I always find this really an interesting story. Right? You can't buy a, a, an, a, an automobile built in this era because they didn't build them. Uh, we were still building tractors. And so as prices rose during the war, right, farmers were only too happy to mechanize and become more and more efficient. But again, this is gonna reduce farm numbers and the number of farmers. It also reduced the need for, uh, for farm labor. Okay. Uh, we're gonna see droughts again in the 50s. We talk about the dirty 30s and the filthy 50s. Uh, and in the 1960s, we see another period of declines. South Dakota, oops, I'm missing a number there. Whoop, missing one digit. Uh, oh boy, I'd have to look that one up. I apologize. I just typed this one in about half an hour ago. But yeah, in the 1960s, South Dakota's population fell. Not that far, thankfully. Right. Of course, in the 1970s, uh, we're going to see other problems. It's going to be a time of very high interest rates, and that's very hard on farming uh, communities because farmers rely on credit and no more so uh, than in the, when you think about uh, young farmers just getting into the business. You know, if you're looking at a 14% interest rate, whoa, uh, that's a tough thing to overcome to, you know, to reach profitability. And we're gonna have this horrific farm crisis of the 1980s where we've got you know, overproduction and low prices. Uh, you know, there's a, sort of a, a, a peculiar story that we see over and over and over. Farmers are always trying to increase their productivity, but that runs into the law of supply and demand when you have something that's more common, its value falls. And so we're gonna see farmers ultimately getting less uh, from uh, you know, what they produce. And again, we've got those land values falling again. We've got a, got a bit of a boom bust cycle going on. And again, more and more farmers leaving. And this affects entire communities. Right? You've gotta think about the people who rely on farmers I also want to think about the psychological effects. Do South Dakotans consider themselves to be living in a rural ag state? I think we can safely say that. Yeah. Less and less so over time. Now, South Dakota's population has definitely grown, but it's been a, a relatively slow growth in comparison to the national growth. Uh, in my South Dakota history class, I'll compare us to California. That's a tough comparison. They grow a lot faster. For some reason, people like their weather better. I don't know. 
what this means is we're going to see a really big changes certainly on the farm. And uh, South Dakota, like other places, has grown more urban over the decades. And that's in part because we've got all these changes going on that mean we need fewer farmers. We've got mechanization, improved breeding, uh, use of synthetic herbicides, insecticides, and fertilizers. Again, this is part of that old story of maximizing efficiency in order to increase profit margins on crops that pay less and less over their production costs. And production costs were rising. Those synthetic fertilizers and uh, insecticides and, and herbicides, a number of them are, are gonna be coming out of oil. And oil became more and more expensive in this era. Equipment was more and more expensive. Uh, and it all ran again on gasoline or diesel. I, I love to ask my students this and I'll see what reaction I get from you. I, I, I'll ask, so who here has a combine? Anybody? Oh, nobody. All right. I asked, what costs more, your combine or your house? And the students whose families own combines, they always smile at me. Like, well, that's a silly question. You know the answer to that. Yeah, it's your combine, obviously. Yeah, equipment's expensive, and equipment means debt. Farmers can't get away with not mechanizing. I always joke, you're not going to be the one who says, well, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. A scythe was good enough for my grandfather. All right, now you're not going to be making it in the market today. And so smaller numbers of farmers are going to work uh, ever smaller numbers of farms. Uh, and again, machinery pays for itself better on large farms. If you look at a farm size, right, it's just getting larger and larger. Right? And uh, I mean, 1,459 acres, that's enormous in comparison to a lot of uh, farms back east. Quite a shift. Now, this trend of larger farms illustrates the degree to which farmers left the profession. All right, we've got farms getting larger. That you know, South Dakota is not getting larger. It just means we have fewer people farming. Well, when people get out of farming, uh, their neighbors or outside developers buy that land. And farmers who retired, uh, they tend to actually stay in their communities, right? And so that kind of reduces population loss to a degree, but we are going to definitely see a lot of rural population loss and population shifts. A lot of younger farmers are going to find it hard to get in. And again, as I was saying, farmers are going to be getting less over time for, uh, you know, for uh, their, uh, their products. These last two numbers are a little inflated. Right, that 598 or 439 back in the day reflects when uh, prices were good from ethanol. Right now, we've got very high corn uh, prices because of what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, but if that wasn't happening, I think we'd still see sort of falling absolute values. It's a, a, a tough thing to, to beat. And so the farms grew more and more large with a general trend of fewer and older farmers. And more and more farmers had to have second jobs. We've, we've seen a national trend where we're starting to see the number of farms rise. But if you look at them, a lot of them are right outside of cities. And they're really hobby farms, right? The only way I can afford to have a farm is to have a full-time job doing something else. And uh, we certainly also see another trend in, in rural America where more and more women have been seeking jobs since the 1970s, trying to prop up those family incomes. And the decline in the number of farmers and ranchers impacts all of rural South Dakota. Uh, the Census Bureau tells us that for every six farms or ranches uh, that fail, one business in the nearest town dies. And our, 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 uh, our uh, retail establishments have faced some challenges lately. Right? We've got the Walmart effect. When Walmart uh, first started spreading through rural America, it began wiping out small town businesses. People like to go to Walmart. You can buy a whole lot of stuff there. The prices are low versus going shopping in your small downtown. We can add on to that the Amazon effect. Anybody here buy anything on Amazon lately? <laughs> I'm going to guess, yeah. That's not a local purchase, right? That money's going somewhere else. And so small town businesses faced tough times in the last few decades. Uh, the growth of the Internet 
really hurt local businesses nationally, but I think it hurt here more than in most places. I can't help but when I think about this, think about how things were in the 19th century. Right? In the 19th century, we had what we called farmer wish books, the Sears and Roebuck catalog, Montgomery Ward's catalog. Anybody ever read one of those old ones? They're great. You want to buy everything in them. They brought anything that you could buy anywhere else to rural America. Well, that's what the internet does too. Right? I mean, if I want, I was you know, thinking about buying my dad a, oh, I hope he doesn't watch this, USB microscope for Christmas. And I got on Amazon, I had my choice of about a million of them. Right? Uh, what do you think I'd find if I would go to downtown uh, Brookings looking for a USB microscope? Probably not too many. Oh, there's the Walmart effect, should have shown you that. South Dakota's population has been changing for decades, and it, it, it's, in the rural sense, it's, we've seen the population fall. Rural counties and towns under 10,000 have almost always lost population here, and urbanized counties and cities with more than a population of 10,000 have grown. And South Dakota's small communities have been losing population and sometimes for quite a long time. This figure just amazes me. From 1911 to 1956, South Dakota lost 230 towns. That's an incredible figure. It's staggering. It's a problem common to the Great Plains. A lot of our problems are common to other Plains states. So if we look at the 2010 census, 41 out of 66 counties lost population. Uh, the 2020 census, 33 out of 66 counties, again, mostly rural, right, lost population. And some of these counties have been losing population for a long time. Gregory County, for example, peaked in 1910, and it's been losing numbers ever since. Quite a thing to think about. Well, in 2020, uh, we're going to see six counties, I could go back, I guess, uh, six counties accounted for most of the growth uh, in uh, the state's uh, population, right? 90.49%, uh, 65,593 people came here, and uh, six counties got them, and they're not rural counties. Minnehaha, Lincoln, Pennington, Meade, Union, and Brookings County. 64% of South Dakotans now live in uh, our 10 largest counties. That leaves roughly 36% for the remaining 56 counties. That's really pretty incredible to think about. And as rural and, uh, and town populations declined, they lost more than just business. Right? They lost churches, uh, they lost schools, and churches and schools are kind of bedrock institutions when we're talking about community. And that makes towns less attractive to outsiders. It means you're not likely to grow. Uh, I think we're also seeing some changes in attitudes. One of the things I'll often ask students is, uh, I, I, when I talk about westward expansion, you talk about how the, the interior of the country was much more welcoming of immigrants. Uh, Dakota Territory, the South Dakota, used to be very immigrant heavy. Because when you're starting a new community, you need bodies. Right? The more people who come, the more likely it is you're going to attract, say, merchants or doctors or lawyers. And so, boy, they wanted people. South Dakota, or Dakota Territory, pardon me, used to have an immigration bureau. We were trying to get people to come in, right? And so for years, I've asked how many people were small, from a small town, would your town like to have some more people? And people would say yes. And in recent years, when I've asked, they've said no. Uh, every time I hear that, I think your town's gonna die because you have to welcome people in, right? Partly because of some trends I'm gonna talk about here. Fewer people come to places like South Dakota because, well, if your community doesn't have a school, are you going to move there? I've got a nephew who had, uh, well, he graduated now, but he had an, uh, over an hour ride each way to school. Now, that's not very attractive if you're from a place where the school is usually 15 minutes away. It's a very worrisome trend. Right. We're also seeing a, a, a region-wide phenomenon known as the graying of the plains because young people like to leave. I used to be in Nebraska. I taught Nebraska history. I teach South Dakota history. And at the end of a, a class, I'll always ask, who's planning on staying? 
And I, I think I've had a few students throw their, uh, their shoulder out, shooting their hand up so fast. I'm getting out of here. Why? Well, there's nothing to do. There's not a lot of opportunity, people will tell me. And so we see this graying of the plains. Young people leave. Uh, they go to bigger cities, other states. And so that means older folks are left. And young people are really important in any dynamic community. People my age don't tend to have a lot of kids. We don't tend to start businesses. Right? The middle aged tend to be a little less active, in other words. Right? We don't start ranches and farms. Now, some of this has been offset by uh, uh, some, some recent changes. Oh, yeah, well, I should mention, uh, yeah, there we go. We've got the red areas there. That more people are dying than are actually being born. We've got negative population. Those young folks, we talk about them leaving. That's part of brain drain. Right? South Dakota is right in the middle of the states for brain drain. Uh, people are going to the green areas, leaving the purplish areas. I, can sh I know, how are, how are your eyes? Just kidding. Right? Uh, South Dakota youth tend to go to Nebraska or Minnesota, number one. Uh, Nebraska, uh, North Dakota. There we are. Right. Let's think about immigration. That's an interesting story. In 1965, uh, the United States liberalized its immigration laws, and we saw an acceleration of immigration after four decades of very tight laws. Right. And uh, so that meant we had some in, uh, movement in. And uh, I remember uh, we, uh, when I first got here, or not long after, we started to hear a lot of talk about how the, the African-American population had risen. It was really not the African-American population, but the African-descended population. Uh, Lutheran Social Services has been bringing immigrants to the central part of the country for decades because it's comparatively affordable to live here compared to the coasts. Right? And so we started to see a rise in uh, African-descended people, uh, Asian, uh, immigration as well, Hispanic immigration, those populations have been growing. But that is often an urban story. Right? A lot of these folks are moving to cities. Right? Hispanics have been uh, the, the one group that's been more likely to move into rural areas. Right? So let's start looking at some of these populations. Right? From by 1950, there were only 727 blacks living in South Dakota. Uh, the big increase came in the, in the 2000s when the population reached 10,207, or about 1.3% of the population. Uh, by 2020, it was 14,698, about 2.3% of the population. But again, this is not internal African-American migration, it's African immigration. Uh, one really interesting story is we have 2,000 Liberians living in Sioux Falls. Um, if, I don't know if you know the history of Liberia, but it was a country that the United States founded or established in, uh, in Eastern Africa uh, when people were talking about colonizing uh, formerly enslaved people. Uh, there was this idea, we've got to ship them back to Africa. Right? And so we're going to have thousands of uh, formerly enslaved uh, African Americans go there in the 1800s, and then they're gonna, some of them are going to make a circuitous route back to what's now Sioux Falls. Quite an interesting story. It's quite, a, quite an impressive increase. Most of the state's African-American or African population has been centered in Sioux Falls. Uh, the Asian population has also risen in recent decades. In 1990, there were only 3,123 people of Asian descent. Uh, by 2000, 4,378. Uh, and uh, uh, by 2010, 7,610. Uh, and, uh, uh, or pardon me, uh, that actually that's the current figure. So we're up to 1.5% uh, of an Asian population in the state. The Hispanic population growth has been the most rapid and also the most recent. And we don't have uh, population figures uh, until 1940. The census showed all of 320 people of Hispanic origin being here in South Dakota. By 1980, there were 2,000. 926, by 2000, there were 10,903, and by 2020, 
the population had risen to 4.2% of the state's population, 29,901. It's a very rapid and very recent growth. Now, these immigrants tend to be younger. Right? Older folks don't tend to go very far. Uh, that means they're more likely to have children. And this is certainly made up for some of the exodus of white South Dakota youth. And again, much of this or most of this ethnic or racial diversification has been in the mid-sized and larger communities. Rural South Dakota continues to be predominantly white. Now, it's not just the population that has diversified. I would argue that diversification really is the story of uh, recent South Dakota, but you have to think of it in very broad terms. We've certainly seen the economy diversify. Uh, like most states, agriculture plays less of a role economically than it ever did. And South Dakota has been actively diversifying its economy. Governor after governor after governor has tried to find a, a way to diversify the economy outside of agriculture. And this is very much at odds against that common image that South Dakota is primarily an ag state. And so we've seen this attempt to move away from a strict dependency on, on agriculture. I don't think our identity has changed as quickly as our reality, though. Agriculture now is only one of many important industries when viewed from the standpoint of its economic impact and the numbers of people that are either directly or indirectly involved in the industry. Uh, I, I was looking at some uh, Department of Labor, South Dakota Department of Labor reports. Only three industries haven't expanded in recent years, and I want to quote the 2019 report. The three industries which had decreased GDP in 2019 were agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting industry, the mining, quarrying, and oil and gas extraction industry, and the utilities industries. Now those represented South Dakota's traditional economy. And so we've seen a real growth in manufacturing. Right, look where things are gonna be, these are the, the, the jobs that are um, more likely to be, oh, wait a minute, actually, scratch that, let's hold that thought. Uh, so here we can see uh, non-agricultural and agricultural jobs. They're not going up. If you look at the jobs that are going up in uh, percentage and in raw numbers, it's food services, right? look at that, uh, hospitals, professional scientific technical services, education is also still growing. Right. Manufacturing, service industries, Retail, they're growing in importance, and farming brings in a smaller share of the state's economic production all the time. And we really most see this in uh, the smaller and mid-sized cities. Here's a nice Brookings shot for you. Right. Brookings is a great example. We've got the 3M plant. Uh, we've got Larson Manufacturing, Twin City Fan. Uh, we've got Bell Cheese. Really, only the, that last one is related in any way to agriculture. And we've certainly seen manufacturing grow in the smaller cities as well, but I, uh, I need to qualify that. So if, if you go to Britain, for example, they've got two companies manufacturing building trusses, sort of like you can see in this building. We've got a precision machining company that services other companies. We've got uh, another that manufactures engine cooling products. And certainly uh, employees didn't just come from Britain, but from the surrounding area. And that's been a requirement for industry. You typically think of industry growing in places where you've got a, a base of workers. We don't have big concentrations. I was giving this talk uh, earlier and I had somebody in the audience who was from the area and she said, yep, and if that closed, that one of those places closed, we'd be in trouble. And that is definitely a characteristic of this economic diversification. It's kind of shallow. Uh, we've got lots of uh, small, com uh, small uh, companies in small towns. Right? Now, changes in infrastructure have certainly impacted rural South Dakotans' lives in both positive and negative ways. South Dakota was a, a state that was slow to develop its infrastructure. So here we're looking at Clayson's 1931 map of uh, South Dakota highways. I actually, I should correct that. Uh, there was one uh, highway that was uh, sort of, well, I take it back, somewhat improved uh, when Calvin Coolidge came out here in 1927 and made the black, uh, the uh, state game lodge his, uh, his summer White House. There was a, a, a rapid road improvement plan. We can't let him think that we're a bunch of hicks out here. 
We don't want them driving on a dirt road all the way across the state. That wouldn't do well. Right? Only in the cities did you actually see paved roads. Anybody here been on a good South Dakota road when it rains and it's not paved? Yeah. Hey, what century are we living in? Right? Now, uh, the Interstate or the Federal uh, Aid Highway Act of 1956, which is what created our uh, national interstate system, really deeply altered South Dakota's uh, population. And the results of that are I-29 and I-90. And this is sort of another time when you, you can see sort of echoes, right? Uh, when uh, people first, uh, when Americans started first coming to Dakota Territory, we didn't have railroads here, and they built towns like, uh, anybody been to Madari lately? Just kidding, there's no, there, there's just a couple of houses in Madari. Uh, they wanted to be the county seat, they had all kinds of high hopes. Uh, and then when the railroad came through, it did not build through Madari, it built through Brookings, which became the home of Madari's population. Like I said, there are a couple of houses there and, and, a, and an obelisk uh, to tell you there used to be a town here. Uh, if you weren't on the railroad, you were in trouble. And it's the same story with the interstates. Almost all of our growth has been along those interstates. Now they built those interstates where the growth was already to some degree. Right, so, you know, we've got, uh, you know, uh, it was already sort of, it amplified previous uh, conditions, I guess. But if you're far off of there, right, there's not, uh, you know, there's not much, as much prosperity. Right? I just drove this summer across the state. For some reason, I decided I would take two lanes. I should have watched the weather map first, but that's another story. Uh, but you can really drive a long distance without seeing anybody once you're off those interstates. I love it when we bring people in and fly them into Sioux Falls for job interviews. And I'll say, whew, boy, not a lot between here and there, right? And they say, oh, boy, it's empty. And I say, well, you just went through one of the more populated parts of the state. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Now, the, the, uh, the six counties that gained the bulk of, the most, of, uh, the, of growth in the recent uh, uh, census, uh, censuses uh, have been along the interstates. It's very much, again, sort of like the, uh, what happened with the railroads. And uh, travel is different on the interstate, right? Back in the day when everybody was going pretty slowly down two lanes, you stopped, right? Oh, we need food, let's stop and go to a restaurant. And here, do you stop when you're going, when you're going 80 miles an hour on one of our interstates? You stop as little as you can, right? Yeah, that means you're going by all sorts of businesses and you're not stopping there. Right? So the interstates have really uh, sort of magnified some problems. They've also helped things though. Uh, those two interstates certainly made it easier to ship crops and manufactured goods across the state to national and international markets. And uh, they certainly helped another industry, the tourism industry. That is one of the larger industries here in the state. It's a service industry. And it certainly uh, you know, brought in a lot of outside money. Right? And it, you don't wanna just think about the obvious sites like say Mount Rushmore or the uh, the Badlands, right? but you really want to think also about how we've got a lot of hunting. That's a really big tourist industry. 11% right? of our tax revenue comes from tourism. It's a very high percentage compared to most states. Let's think about some other uh, causes of change and again more parallels. Uh, one of the, the, the biggest differences between rural America and urban America a uh, hundred or so years ago was how, how dark it got very quickly in rural America. And uh, that's because most of rural America was not electrified. It's expensive to run power lines. And uh, in this case, the, uh, you know, the market did not take care of all of our problems. It was simply too expensive. And so rural America was dark. I love to ask my classes, how many of you have read a book by candlelight or a gas lamp? Anybody? Anybody here try? When the power goes out, you don't try and read? I've tried. I lasted about two pages. I thought, well, that was a fun experiment. My eyes hurt. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. You go to bed. Right? Uh, Brookings here, by the way, had an early experimental electrical lighting system uh, downtown back in the, I think in the 1880s, very early. So we have this problem where yeah, rural America was very dark. 
Uh, and uh, we're going to see some small efforts by, uh, you know, by uh, uh, industry to, to send those lines to the farms. But again, it's extremely expensive. Copper has never been cheap. And so in the 19, uh, from the 30s to the 50s, we have the rural electrification program that's going to really change people's lives. And think about how many things you rely on every day that require electricity. An awful lot of what we do requires electricity. And it's not just a matter of entertainment, but also, you know, I mean, look, she's running a vacuum cleaner. She's not taking that rug out and beating it once a year or twice a year the way people used to. You can do this any old time. You can leave the lights on if you want and stay up late. I bring this up because we have a similar situation with the internet. Uh, when COVID first hit, uh, it was uh, a real rude surprise for everybody, but I'll tell you, educators, boy, did we, uh, we found some, we had challenges we didn't know about. Uh, I went off on spring break, and I feel real bad about it. The last thing I said was, yeah, there's this disease that's going around. I don't think anything's going to happen. Uh, and then suddenly we had a week to go online, and one of the things we quickly realized was that a lot of our students from more rural areas didn't have high-speed internet. Now, you might have internet, but you weren't going to be showing them a video. Uh, this is, that was the semester I learned what Zoom was. You're not going to be running a Zoom lesson. And a lot of us went to Zoom, but if somebody has no high-speed internet, they're not doing that. And I definitely had students who were doing that thing where you drive out next to a school and park in the parking lot so you could be part of a Zoom. Yeah, we suddenly saw the holes that we had for the internet. Uh, anybody, who, who was not on the internet today? I'm just curious, not. All right, we've got one person. Yeah, oh my. We've kind of grown dependent on it, haven't we? After last summer's derecho, my, uh, my wife and I, we lost power for oh, a day or so, and then when it came on, we're like, good, now we can have some entertainment, and our internet was out because it, we came, it was on that side of the house. I was like, well, now what are we gonna do? We don't have TV, and well, okay, don't have internet, uh-oh. So yeah, the internet has become somewhat indispensable. Broadband is important, and it's maybe in some ways more important here than in others. There was an interesting statistic that came out in 2010. Facebook reported that South Dakota had a higher percentage of uh, people who were Facebook members than any other state. And you think about rural South Dakota, right? Uh, I like to ask my students, you know, especially when I've got a few kids from uh, rural areas, how, how close is your nearest neighbor? Oh, yeah, they're three miles, four miles. Right? Well, let's see what's going on on Facebook. Uh, yeah, people became very dependent on it here, uh, certainly for uh, social communication, for certainly for, uh, again, those uh, uh, to buy uh, material goods. Right? So rural South Dakotans very much are uh, attracted to that, but there's, again, that big problem. They've got less access to social spaces, physically, compared to some city dwellers, so social media is a big deal. And again, uh, it's also entertainment as well. Right? Anybody watch Netflix lately? I'm just going to guess a few of you. So we had this real problem for a lot of people. They were sort of living just like it was 100 years ago when we talk about electricity. You're living in two different worlds if you don't have broadband. And we've seen a real effort uh, to uh, catch up, but South Dakota lags behind most places. Again, it's incredibly expensive uh, to, to run uh, fiber optic networks or around a place without a large number of people. There's a demand, there just isn't uh, enough of a demand to overcome the cost of running those cables. Right? Private companies don't wanna spend a lot of money uh, to run a line several miles to get to one farm. That's just not really uh, financially viable. And this really also, uh, it's not just about entertainment. You want to think also about how many jobs are done online. Right? There are about 75 million jobs in the nation right now that could be done online. And so this, is gonna, this brought about a government effort to build lines, just like we saw with rural electrification. And we've really seen a flurry of change since 2020. 
uh, it's, it's quite amazing to try and keep up with it. Just this week, right, uh, the Department of Commerce's National uh, Telecommunications and Information Ad Administration, it's the MTIA, announced South Dakota received its first Internet for All grants uh, to deploy high-speed Internet networks and also to develop digital skills uh, training for, uh, for young people. There are a couple of related programs, the Broadband Equity Access uh, and deployment program that uh, uh, received $2.6 million to develop a five-year plan to bring access to everyone. We've got the Digital Equity Act that's going to fund more planning to the tune of about $500,000. And this is on top of that Reconnect program by the USDA. And this one was uh, it really got a lot of uh, a big boost through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that uh, passed a couple years ago. It's currently accepting applications to divide up $1.6 billion in funding, mainly to ensure that students have access to broadband. Now, uh, South Dakota's got its own related uh, Connect South Dakota broadband program. Uh, the state legislature gave $5 million in funding to that. And that's a lot of money for South Dakota's legislature. We don't have an income tax, and so the money that our legislature has to uh, to move around is smaller than in most places. But yeah, the legislature still kicked in $5 million. Since 2019, between state and federal funding sources matching industry investment, uh, we've seen uh, over $203 million pumped in uh, into, into broadband, and it's important. I'm going to quote the USDA's Mona Thompson. She said, there are so many possibilities for residents with this new service. Farmers and ranchers will be able to use precision agriculture technologies. Employees can reliably telework and students will be able to attend K through 12 or higher education classes right from their homes. And uh, SDN Communications has been uh, using a two, bill, a two million dollar federal reconnect grant to bring broadband to the cities of the Black Hills. And, and if you went to most states and you said, yeah, we've got cities that don't have broadband, they'd look at you like you had a third arm growing out of the back of your head. But in South Dakota, we're still paying catch up. Just this week, Senator John Thune co-sponsored some new legislation, the Rural Internet Improvement Act, to expand and further extend the USDA's ReConnect program. And, uh, you know, that program is, is, has been working on and off of the state's reservations, and we've certainly seen a real growth in the internet on the reservations. Uh, Cheyenne River and Standing Rock reservations this year got a $17 million grant to expand broadband. And you can get a sense of how much it costs to do this. That $17 million is going to bring access to, well, anybody, give, throw a guess out. I'm going to ask you. How many people do you think $17 million, $17 million would bring the internet to in rural South Dakota? Anybody feeling brave or do I have to start making chicken noises? Just kidding, I won't do that. Anybody feeling brave? Don't, you don't want to make a, don't, you don't want to see a grown man cry. It'll be embarrassing all day for all of us. <laughs> Nobody? All right, I'll tell you. 488 families for $17 million. It's expensive, right? That also, by the way, would uh, help 88 farms and seven businesses. That's in Corson and Dewey counties. We've got the Internet for All program, going to spend $70 million on Pine Ridge and Rosebud. That'll help 3,300 families, a little bit more bang for the buck there, I guess. Uh, Kevin Miller, who's the president of the Oglala Sioux uh, Nation, uh, described the same needs as non-reservation areas. He said, and really it's about the future. It's about making sure that our kids have adequate internet. Uh, Scott Herman, who is the president of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, uh, he also related this to the children who he said were the future. He said some of them had to stay behind a grade because they couldn't provide the internet services at home to do their virtual school, so they never even logged on to the virtual school. Sisseton Reservation is receiving a funding as well, $1.8 in federal funding uh, to uh, bring Internet to about 700 homes on the Lake Traverse Reservation. The Flandreau uh, Reservation, they just got $2.5 million to spread broadband and also buy computers. $2.5 million will benefit about 241 families. 
And I've got to say, it's likely that much of the good news in the future years regarding community health and economic growth is going to come from this expansion of broadband internet. Uh, South Dakota saw a recent rise in population. And I'm sure that some of that is because people in more crowded areas wanted to live somewhere like here where it's not very crowded. And you have to have the internet to do that. And you know the internet is just ever more important given that that's where we have our political discourse, that's where we find our entertainment, that's how businesses operate. It certainly has that potential to erase some of those differences between rural and urban America. And so positive changes in rural life are very possible. I want to talk a little bit about the reservations, and I can't go into as much detail as I might like. It's a, a complicated story. The reservation uh, counties have certainly also uh, had some of the same exact problems uh, that non-reservation counties do, like lack of infrastructure, lack of businesses, and so on. Those reservation counties are all heavily rural. Um, we saw the, the federal relocation program of the 1950s actually shipped a lot of people out of our reservations and into cities like, uh, well, uh, Rapid City, Denver, Minneapolis, Los Angeles. The most steadily increasing group in terms of population uh, is the Native American population. And this is an interesting story, and it's, 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 a, it's also a cultural story. So uh, most Americans in the 19th century thought that Native people were simply going to go extinct. Uh, Native American numbers only went in one direction, and that was down. And uh, there were about 20,225 uh, Native people in the state. Uh, but then their population started to rise. And we start to see this really interesting phenomenon. It's not just uh, one from South Dakota. Right? Uh, the Wounded Knee II uh, occupation of, of uh, Wounded Knee uh, really had a, a profound impact here in South Dakota and actually across all of Indian country. Uh, it really it changed the way a lot of Native people viewed themselves and their communities. And there'd always been this sort of pressure to, if you had Native heritage, you, you hid that. You didn't brag about it, but we started to see within native communities and without this growing sense of pride in our uh, native heritage in this country. And with that, we started to see really rapid gains in population size. Now, either native people were having enormous numbers of children or, and this one's more likely, more people who were native started to claim that heritage. Right? When the census taker comes by, you know, they don't do a DNA test, they ask you and you tell them and more and more people have been claiming their native heritage. So in, in uh, 2000, there were 50,575 people in uh, South Dakota who claimed native heritage. 10 years later, 2010, 71,817. In 2020, we're up to, uh, that was 8.8% .8 of the population. It's grown since, we're there at about 9%. So we've seen this cultural renaissance among the, uh, the state's tribes, particularly among the Lakotas, who are the largest. And those nations have done something very interesting. Right? Uh, they've been really trying to preserve their traditions and culture. Now, U.S. policy up until the 1930s was to destroy tribal cultures, and it's actually going to go on longer than that. Uh, the most obvious place that would have happened, you've heard of those residential boarding schools. If you spoke Lakota, some, you, the, you were hit. And uh, we're going to see this affect generations. And so are you going to teach your children to speak Lakota? No, that doesn't get you anything good. Right? And so all of our languages are in trouble, like all tribal languages are. But we started to see the state's tribes really working to preserve their, their languages and their cultures. And obviously, they're tied together. It's a very conscious story. Right? One really interesting uh, part of this story is that uh, we've started to see the tribal population establish its own educational programs. Education was uh, sort of a weapon in the assimilation uh, program that the United States had for all those decades. And so uh, education kind of got a bad name in many Native communities. But it's an interesting thing to think about. They're starting their own schools. And this is part of a larger story. You want to think about how important it is to tell your own story. Right? And these schools all have 
uh, language programs. Uh, the students can learn to speak Lakota. Uh, they can study traditional arts. They can study uh, 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 native literature, certainly history, as well as more traditional academic subjects. Uh, Sinte Gleshka, by the way, has had a, a, a Lakota Studies Department since 1973. That's pretty incredible to think about. It's got a branch on the Yankton Reservation, uh, Ihunktonwan uh, in Community College. Uh, Oglala Lakota College began as a community college in 1971, one of the first tribally controlled colleges in the nation. And it's also got a branch on Cheyenne River Reservation. Uh, Sisseton Wapton College serves the Dakota population. And it's, it's quite a contrast, you know, what they're doing compared to the, uh, the prior attempts to destroy uh, the Siouan language and culture. We've got native scholars like Craig Howe, Dr. Craig Howe, who's a Lakota, who established the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies near Martin in 2004. And the goal there was to provide a native perspective on the history and the present circumstances of native people. We've seen this also in uh, the rise of Native American journalists. And South Dakota's actually had some pretty important ones. Uh, they've been passing in recent years. Charles Trimble here, Chuck Trimble, uh, passed away just a few years ago. He came to SDSU about 10 years ago or so. He's one of the founders of the Indian Press Association, right? The, a founding father of Native American journalism, right? The executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. That's a, uh, a, a, one of the oldest Native American organizations. And yeah, he's politically active. We can think about Tim Gallego, who just passed away just very recently. Now, Tim Gallego is something of a superstar in, uh, in, uh, in Native American journalism. In 1981, uh, he and uh, his then wife, Doris Gallego, who taught here at SDSU, began a newspaper called Lakota Times. And it, they changed its name to Indian Country Today because it expanded its focus, not just on South Dakota, but all of Native America. Uh, he sold that to the Oneida tribe in 1998. It still exists as a, a web presence. Uh, and he also started another newspaper after that. Uh, he just passed away uh, this year. Right? And let me say, in addition to this, uh, there is a really large, a growing number of uh, internet only uh, Native American uh, uh, news in here in South Dakota. All news is moving to the internet. It's a lot uh, more affordable than killing trees and so on. And so the Lakotas are telling their own story. Oops, hang on a second. Oh, close your eyes, there we go. Sorry, I did a few last minute changes I shouldn't have. We've got uh, Native American radio stations as well. And, and like most radio, this is also available on the internet. You can listen to Keeley Radio right now. And if you listen to Keeley Radio, you're going to hear a lot of Native American music. You're going to hear uh, Lakota language. And you've got to use languages to keep them live. Right? And so again, they're telling their own story. This one started in 1983. It's the largest Indian-owned and operated radio station in the United States. And again, it's got an educational and cultural role, preserving culture and language. Now, uh, the, uh, the Ocheti Shakaween, the Sioux, Drew national attention after a, a, a major landmark legal victory in 1980, United States uh, v. Sioux Nation. Right. After decades of fruitless legal challenges, the court agreed that uh, the United States illegally took the Black Hills in 1877 and awarded the tribe, that means everybody, uh, the 1877 equivalent of uh, $17.1 million plus 5% interest. And that was a modern total of $106 million, not a bad deal for the U.S. even at that price. Anybody know how that story has gone on? Yeah, they've refused to take it. I haven't found any recent figures. The last figure I saw was it was worth over a billion dollars, and they've refused to take it. Uh, they want the Black Hills back. Right. And uh, that's a, something to think about, given that they're some of the most economically disadvantaged people in America. Now, uh, Native people had a bit of a jackpot of another sort. Let's see here. Right. Thanks to uh, in the 1988 Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that recognized that gambling was a traditional part of Native American cultures. And it established a legal framework 
uh, for modern commercial tribal gaming. And the various bands of the Ocheti Shakawin here in South Dakota established nine casinos throughout the state. Uh, and they have brought funds to the reservations that have struggled economically. Uh, our reservations also have done pretty well because uh, the Dakotas in, in Minnesota have been uh, sharing money here in, uh, with their relatives. So uh, on or off reservations, South Dakota's people have lived through an extraordinary century and really an extraordinary last 40 or 50 years. And let me just finish by saying how South Dakotans will define themselves in the future is going to depend on their reactions to the changes in their recent past and in our present. And that is going to be an interesting story. So with that, let me thank you for coming and ask if anybody has any questions. This may be a little bit of a stretch since you're a historian, but looking to the future, <laughs> uh -oh. uh, I work with the SCQ Extension. I'm in charge of our county operations. So sure. like Gregory County, I was there just a couple of days sure. ago. And we see so many counties, like you said, losing population. Yeah. What do our county governments need to be doing to try, or is there anything they can do to yeah. fix the issues? Or is, I mean, are we looking 10, 20 years down the road and counting consolidation, or is there a reversal? Well, I, 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 I mean, I, mind you, this is just me going off the top of my head, but I think that anything that happens is going to have to be a part of a larger policy, whether that's state or national, uh, trying to, to create policies that will attract people to rural America. Because again, we've got a lot of, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges. Again, like with, with the school consolidation. Right? I mean, I, I think a lot of people around this country would have a really hard time imagining going somewhere where their kid's gonna have to get on a very cold school bus and go for an hour or more to school. Um, that's gonna be a real challenge. I suspect we're probably gonna see more consolidations than, uh, it's hard to see this, this turning around in terms of population, it really is. And again, when young people leave, they don't have kids, you know, and so it just gets worse and worse. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be a challenge. I, I'm not sure how we can really reverse that. I think holding the ground where we are now is, is probably as much as we can hope for. But again, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. A lot of people have been trying to figure out these problems and they just have challenge. There, there aren't a lot of obvious solutions. You know, I mean, I, I was thinking of the problem of bringing industry to reservations. There's no difference really in a lot of ways. You know, you've gotta have a, a large number of people before somebody will decide to build a factory. I, I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense to build a factory and say they'll come if you build it. That's just not how it works. Right? You've gotta actually have a population there and our, we're really moving toward those I-29 and 90, you know, or people going out to Minneapolis or Denver, depending on what part of the state you're in. It's a challenge. I mean, I wish I had better news, but um, you know, people are definitely thinking about it. So if anybody's got any ideas, shout out. Dell, you got an idea. Just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, back in the early 90s, the Cooper Elections Commission had trouble getting the law passed to limit uh, the purchase of outdoor land by outside corporations. Has that been effective also? Or only by that? Um, well, you know, I. I, I I don't. I, I guess it depends what you mean by you know what a threat would be. You know, I mean those if they're those outside corporations are going to be running f you know uh, agricultural operations, they'll need employees, uh, but it's not ownership, and they certainly you know those folks aren't going to be paid especially well. Um, yeah, I, uh, I yeah I don't, I don't know. I mean how you know I don't know what the effect would be to be honest with you. Um, you know, normally when you think of outside companies coming in, you think about land development. But we're not putting up, you know, we're not outside of Denver, right, where the houses go up so fast you drive by a neighborhood, you think, well, that wasn't there last week. Uh, and that's usually what happens when outside corporations are buying in other areas. So I, I'm not sure how that would really affect things. South Dakota has always been, and it's such an irony, uh, we've always been really dependent on the federal government. 
Uh, so you're, you know, we're here at a, a, at a Morrill Land Grant School. Um, we got double the normal acreage through the Morrill Land Grant. Uh, because they, you know, this was, it was pretty obvious this was going to be a tough place to live. Let's give them something to develop the place. We have been more dependent on the federal government than most states. And in the 1930s, we were per capita, we got highest, the highest rate of uh, federal aid. And so, uh, you know, there's this sort of sense of independence while we get an enormous part of our, our state budget from federal money. Um, we are really dependent. We just don't want to admit it. And so, yes, the states that you know, are more economically viable, uh, I think, are less dependent. But we're very dependent. Uh, anyone else? Anybody feeling brave? Um, you just gave the story of the book so much. I felt it was time. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, the Poppers were a pair of sociologists from Rutgers, and they did this as sort of a thought exercise. They, they argued that maybe uh, in the 19th century we, we went a little too far, and places like this weren't so viable. And they, 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 you know, there's this rural decline that I've been talking about where we've got 100 years and more in some places where the population's only gone down. You know, it's, you know, that was something that, that you know, they were thinking about. This was a thought exercise. You know, my question when it came to the poppers is, well, what about, say, Brookings or North Platte, Nebraska? There are some substantial communities, and you couldn't just tell those people, well, we're going to give this back to the buffalo because that's what they were saying. Maybe we ought to just make this a game reserve and return it to the grasslands. Um, it was a thought exercise. They, they got a lot of death threats, um, and it wasn't a real popular idea. But it, it does make you think about how we, we maybe went a little far. There were a lot of efforts uh, in, in certainly parts of the plains, like for example, in Nebraska, uh, we have the Kincaid Act where uh, the federal government came in in northwestern Nebraska and said, gosh, nobody's homesteaded here, so we're gonna give them up to a, square, you know, a, a whole section of land. And it turns out a whole section of really dry land is also a great place to fail. Um, so, um, could, you, could you repeat the, the first part of that? Oh, yeah, um, not in, you know, uh, there, there's been some uh, talk about, you know, with, uh, um, you know, the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, wind power taking land out of, uh, of production, more solar power. I've seen that more as a discussion. I don't think we've seen any big solar arrays here, but I've seen some folks saying we can't do that. Uh, I'm not so worried about it because, you know, what are we doing with most of our corn? We're putting it into ethanol. So it's not like people are going to go hungry if we don't grow more of that corn because people don't eat that corn between you and me. It's not really very tasty. Um, so I, I haven't seen any big arrays here. South Dakota is not really on the leading edge of renewable energy. I think if we had a more sort of, you know, uh, welcoming climate, you know, a lot of those, uh, you know, those windmills that you see are actually owned by um, Minnesota firms, and there's also a lot of Scottish development. Oddly enough, the Scots, for some reason, have long invested on the Great Plains. I've never quite understood it, but um, so you know, we haven't really developed it internally. And I, but I, I don't think I've seen very much, you know, going on there. Uh, anybody else? Well, folks, let me thank you for coming out. I hope that uh, all made a bit of sense and was uh, worth your time on this beautiful day. You could have sat outside soaking up 40-degree temperatures, which are going to feel really warm shortly. So thank you so much for coming out. I really do appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always write me. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm on the website at SDSU. I'm in the history department, Charles period Volan at sdstate.com, and I'd be happy to continue this conversation. So thanks so much for coming out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.